Hello and welcome back to the Corico Couch. Now, who do I have on the couch with me this week? Well, it is our first outside guest. So, you should be honoured. I am. And welcome to Chris Barry, who is a director of Thomas Legal. And I asked you how you want to be introduced, and you said international man of mystery. I am. So you're an international man of mystery as well. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Welcome. What a treat. I know. It's nice, day. isn't it? You're gorgeous. You gorgeous. like the couch? I do like the couch. Very it's comfortable. Good. Very at ease. Good. You can get all sorts of information out of me today. <laughs> Well, hopefully, what we're going to do is try and demystify part of the mortgage process, which is around solicitors, conveyances, because that is what you do. The dark arts behind the curtain. <laughs> the let's, dark go, let's go behind the curtain. Yeah, it's like the stay. Wizard of Oz, like it peeling is. back it the is. curtain. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because it is one of the biggest questions that we get is mm. what does my solicitor or conveyancer do? And mm. actually, that's the first question. Mm. Solicitor or conveyancer? Yeah, excellent question. Something I get asked every day. Mm. And we have both. So really, there isn't an awful lot of difference providing that individual practices residential property on a daily basis. Right. So really, it comes down to education. And those people that have studied to be a solicitor, either in school or in work, uh, in university or in work, and have got the qualification, probably en route to doing so, having to sit in different seats, maybe family or commercial or private clients, okay. and have a broader knowledge of the law. Yeah. A conveyancer would have just studied specifically in residential property. In my mind, there is no difference in quality, apart from the fact that if you ask a solicitor a question during the process about something other mm. than residential conveyancing, they may have a broad knowledge. Right, okay. How, how would you describe then your role in in the process so usually it's one of the first things isn't it that yeah. you go in you see an estate agent you make an offer on the property and they say right who's your solicitor or who's your conveyancer yeah where do you get involved from mm. and what would you say is your role what what do you do on a on a day-to-day -day basis i don't think we get involved early enough in my mind the client journey is either you go to your estate agent and say, how much can I sell my house for? Yeah. Or you go to your mortgage broker and say, how much can I borrow? Yeah. I think the conveyancer needs to be at that stage, but is never considered until yeah, much after. Yeah. I think the reason for that is because the general pub public just maybe don't understand that they need one or the importance, yeah. of, hence the podcast. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really important to understand the need for a conveyancer, a property lawyer during the process. And at that stage, once an offer has been accepted, an estate agent will say, right, where's your lawyer's details? And the client might say, well, I haven't got one. Mm, yeah. <laughs> they say, well, you need one for us to be able to issue what's called the memorandum of sale, which is pretty much heads of terms. So it'll say buyer, buyer's lawyer, seller's, seller's lawyer, price paid, any special instructions, out it goes to both sets of lawyers. Mm. Or a mortgage broker, a good mortgage broker, will say if they're remortgaging or purchasing, you need to get a solicitor involved to do yeah. this, and an introduction will be made at that stage. So in terms of the process, it then comes across to us, and there are, there are so many parts to this that are important, but right at the beginning, a law firm cannot conduct any serious legal work until they have carried out identification checks and anti-money laundering checks. Yeah. They cannot accept identification from an estate agent. Mm -hmm. They can accept identification from a body who is regulated by the FCA, yeah. as most mortgage or mortgage all mortgage broker, brokers yeah. will be, providing they've seen them face-to-face. -face. Yeah. And there are some prop tech firms available now, Third Fort being one of them, yeah. that will, will carry out the identification checks and share it between lawyers that have signed mm. up to the platform brokers and estate agents which is which is the dream really yeah we don't want clients doing it three times no exactly once is probably yeah. enough um but anti-money laundering checks is really interesting so an estate agent will say we need to see proof of funds yeah and that could just be a bank That's statement a deposit to say, money i've yeah. got the money yeah a mortgage broker will need a bit more because it needs to get through underwriting and credit policy yeah a lawyer will need even more a lawyer needs to establish source of wealth right okay so when you have a client who has saved some money over some period of time, fairly easy. Bank statements and pay slips, yeah. that's just available now on your phone. I mean, back in the day, this took weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah. 
if you didn't have a bank statement, you had to go and order it. Yeah. If you didn't have a bank statement, you would order it. But uh, now it goes one step further. So when a client is receiving gifted money, which many first-time buyers are, yeah, do you know absolutely. the stats? I don't, I don't know, 50% or something? I mean, the bank Huge. of mum and dad now and the bank yeah. of gran and granddad is, mm. is massive. Yeah. I think if the bank of mum and dad were a lender, mm. they'd be a top six really? lender. Is, wow. I mean, it's massive. That's yeah. incredible. And, uh, you know, that is only going to get bigger mm. and larger because the I think at the moment, the amount of income to property value is about six and mm. a half times. Yeah. I mean, London's 10, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So I think the bank at the moment, that bit will become more prevalent. So if you're receiving a gift, the checks on the person gifting the money is the same as the person buying the property. Yeah. So the law firm will need to go through identification checks on the person gifting. Where did you get your money from? Mm. Can you sign a letter to say it's a gift, not a loan? What if there's multiple gifts? That has to be done on every single person. What if the gift is coming from abroad, which in a yeah. lot of circumstances, yeah. especially in London, it is. Yeah. This is a tremendous process and nothing mm. can happen until that's done. So quite often, three, four weeks into the transaction, the state agent saying to their seller, oh, your buyer's not serious. They're not doing anything. Mm. The lawyer can't say, I'm still waiting on funding information from a great aunt in a different country. Yeah, no, because they can't say that. Yeah. So, yeah, that that is a substantial part of the process yeah. and one of the key reasons why it's taking longer. Mm. Once that is done, then something tangible can happen and that's taking money from the client for searches and ordering searches. Yeah. And searches, I think, give the vendor some comfort. They, they think, right, okay, my client's parting with some money, they're obviously mm. serious. And the reason I think people are quite edgy and nervous before that point is because searches can take so long. Every single local authority has a different time scale. Some are five days. I know some are 12 weeks. Right. Hackney got hacked. Yeah. They didn't have a time scale. They were a year or two. Yeah. So that search indemnity kicked yeah. in. So so explain what 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 do those searches show then? And yeah. do you usually start that? before the mortgage offer comes out? Or in a lot of cases, it's wait for the mortgage offer and then start the searches. Would you advise that? Or would you actually say, do you know what, if you're serious about buying, get it get it going now? I would say get them going now. I would go one mm. step further. If a client is selling, I would say to them to get the searches. Yes. If yeah. they're serious. Yeah. It's a, it's a tangible way of significantly speeding up the process. Yeah. So I would say get them done ASAP. Mm. With us, particularly, if you order your searches and the matter falls through, then we'll give the searches for free on the next purchase. Oh, wow. So let's say the okay. mortgage offer yeah. for the amount they want doesn't come through, yeah. or the lender doesn't like that property, then it can abort, go on to the next one, mm. and they don't have to pay twice. Yeah. Searches cover a wide variety of things. The best way I describe it is imagine looking at a property without the property there. Yeah. So it covers land conditions, flood risk, planning permission, right. past, present, and future, land charges, community infrastructure, all these things that perhaps many people mm. wouldn't think about, yeah. but are crucially important. So if there's like an old abandoned mine nearby that could have an effect or there's plans yeah. to build a, yeah. a motorway through the garden or yeah. something Raid like on that. gas. Right. You know, okay. all, the, yeah. all these types of things that may affect somebody's decision to buy a property, yeah. but rarely get thought of. Yeah. So it's the local authority search that takes the longest. Mm. All the others can be sort of 24 hours, so much quicker. Mm. Um, but local authority one is the key one. And so throughout this process then, who do you act for? Because that's another thing that, um, that, that a lot of people ask because it, I would say actually throughout the whole process, we're the only, the broker's the only one who truly acts for the client. But but you're you're acting for both client and lender is that is that how it works yeah that's that's a great question so um the lender needs representing legally mm. the client doesn't but should so when a lawyer so the client doesn't but should mm. that's really i never knew yeah. that that's yeah, so you really don't have to have a lawyer right but 99.9% yeah. of people do. But you won't get a everybody mortgage should. without like, no. Yeah. Exactly. So lender yeah. needs representing, yes, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So in an ideal world, the lawyer that the client chooses is on what's called the lender panel yeah. and can represent both. It's quicker. 
and it's cheaper. But if the lawyer isn't on the lender panel, then the lender will have to be represented separately or the client chooses a, a different lawyer. Mm. And that is more expensive and takes longer. So what you don't want as a lawyer or a client is too many parties involved. Yeah. And being able to represent both is is just much more convenient. Mm. That's really interesting. And the 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 other thing is is obviously fees. Mm. Now that that's a question we we always got. What are your typical fees? Of uh, you don't need to go say what your typical fees are, but but what are the typical fees in a mortgage transaction? Obviously, you've got the conveyancing fee. Well, how does that that work? And and what does that cover? And where are Sometimes there are a lot of add-ons. Mm. Where, where do those yeah. add-ons come from? If you could just e yeah. explain that, that would be interesting. Yeah, three sets of fees. The legal fee, the supplements, and the disbursements. Right. The legal fee, quite simply, is a headline figure, and it's a charge for the lawyer's time involved, more often than not a fixed price, but some lawyers, maybe more old-fashioned ones, yeah. will charge by the hour. Right, yeah. The supplements, they tend to cover the add-ons. So this will be searches. Searches would normally come under supplements, sometimes disbursements, mm. depending on whether it's vatable as a package or not. Something called a mortgage lender fee. So quite often clients will say, well, hang on, I'm paying my broker. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't need to pay yeah. you for a mortgage. I'm, I'm getting a mortgage. But that covers the lawyer's time to act for the mortgage lender because some clients buy in cash. So I guess the best way to think of the legal fee, that's basic. So anything a client's doing, not out of the ordinary, but perhaps above the basic level, like getting a mortgage, then these things will be charged for separately mm. normally. Leasehold property is more work than a freehold property. So that's normally charged mm. as an extra supplement. And that's because you have to go through the lease, presumably. Yeah, which could be tremendous. Yeah. I would say on average, leasehold properties are taking eight weeks longer than a, wow. than, than a freehold property. Yeah. So, of course, that's extra work that needs to be charged yeah. for. A conveyance isn't going to do that for free. Yeah. And even now, with the Building Safety Act, is is a lot more. So... <laughs> yeah, that, that's a whole other... <laughs> that's podcast? a whole other question. <laughs> Potentially a whole bigger <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Um, the, the other... Some of the other things to think about is whether the property is new build, whether it's shared ownership, mm. whether a client's getting a gifted deposit, whether it's an international gift. So these are all the supplements that can start to build up the picture of complexity yeah. and therefore the amount of time and effort involved. And then disbursements are normally third-party costs. So a land registry fee, for example, would be, would be a great representative of a, of a disbursement. That, uh, that is obviously a fee charged by the land registry to register the client on there as the legal owner and the mortgage company on there as the first yeah. legal charge. A lawyer doesn't charge that money, they collect it from the client mm. and pass it on. Stamp duty is another one that always features as a disbursement. So really what the lawyer's quote is doing is building up a picture for yeah. the client of how much they need to budget and for. And you always... But I've seen some of the, mm. the quotes, and you always section it off, and these are, these are what the fees are, etc. Yeah, yeah. What, what so I it's would pretty say, clear. Yes, well, yes, you say that. My best advice for any client or any uh, mortgage broker or agent acting for a client, if they're looking at lawyer's fees, is read the small print. Yeah. There are so many. There, there are thousands of conveyances, mm. and they quote in thousands of different you ways. You told me how many there are. How many? It's four and a half thousand conveyances in the UK, and that's firms, yeah, not yeah, people. Yeah, practicing. Yeah, that's only that, some are one I never months, knew obviously. there was that many. That's yeah, massive, yeah. So it's it? a lot. It's a lot. So the poor old clients, they yeah. won't know where to turn if they go on Google for, uh, I don't know, any of the first four pages. Yeah, they'll get a really, really small headline figure, and they might go to their law firm on the high street and get a higher figure. Mm. And think, well, convincing is convincing. Why wouldn't I go for this one? And actually, the devil's in the detail. Yeah. You quite often find at the end you'll get charged a lot more. You want the most transparent quotes. The reason I don't think is because they're trying to be sneaky all of the time. I think the problem is they're not asking the right questions at the beginning. Mm. If, you, if you're doing it online, maybe the form isn't detailed enough for your specific yeah. scenario. Yeah. Or if you're speaking to an individual, that individual needs to be so experienced or qualified to ask you the right questions, to generate the right answers, to generate the right price. Yeah. That's, so that, that's a really key point then, if you're looking for a solicitor and you're talking, talking to one, is um, 
is to ask them the question, is this the actual fee I'll be paying mm. or will there be additional extras yeah. and what could they look like and quite, to get that full picture? Yeah, quite That's often. That's a really good point. The client won't know what they're buying. On the seller yeah, side, maybe a true. bit easier. Yeah. But on the buyer side, depending on the quality of the agent, you might be faced with something where you've got half the information. Now, there's something coming into play called material information in the estate agency world, mm. which ensures a lot more information is being given up front to the potential buyer. But is it covering everything? No, I don't think it is. Mm. So there are lots of different legal representatives out there. Mm. A lot of people come to us and they've been suggested, shall we say, that they should or need to use the recommended conveyances that the estate agent mm. recommends. Have you got have you got an opinion on that generally or is that Yeah, yeah. It's a great it's a great question because I think the hard sell occasionally is use our lawyer because we can control the process. Mm. It will be faster and there'll be lots of promises. Mm. And in some instances, that might yeah, be true. In some instances, they can, can't they? Yeah, because of the I relationship. So. Yeah. If the relationship is a good one, then I think it works. If it is relationship-based. Yeah. If it is fee-based, yeah. which a lot of them are, especially in the corporate world, then I think we've got a real problem. This is a ticking time bomb beyond all proportion. I am seeing quotes on a daily basis where, well, quotes or engagement letters, I, I don't know, some, some are in the quotes, some are in the engagement letters. But I, I'm seeing documents from other agents and law firms that say the headline figure to the client is X. And let, let's just say that figure's £1,500. Yeah. The referral fee to the panel organising the solicitors for the agent mm. is, say, £400. Mm. And then the referral fee to the estate agent for making the introduction is £400. Oh, wow. So the law firm is walking away with less money than the agent and panel. Okay. And that does not work. Yeah. I will give you a great example. Last year, there were four or five law firms selling their services really cheap through this panel relationship mm. model with mass corporates. And uh, they had thousands of clients in their pipeline and they went bust, some of which they were able to continue to transact using other law firms, mm. some they weren't. And these poor clients stuck in limbo were calling law firms all over the country. Yeah. I'm due to exchange next week. Can you help me? And the problem is that law firm then takes on all of the risk, yeah. not knowing where the quality of work. So most firms are reluctant to do it. Yeah. Or if they do take it, they start from scratch. And that doesn't take a week. Yeah. So I think clients need to be really careful. And they might not know this information. They can ask, you're recommending me to this mm. lawyer on what basis? How much are you getting paid? Is there a panel in the middle? How much are they getting paid? I don't think there's anything wrong with asking that question. Mm. Are you seeing more of that in like the new build market and the equity release space where actually the people are more forceful about having to use their recommended solicitors? Yeah, the new build space is really interesting. So once a conveyancer has completed all of the due diligence and the process on one unit on that development, a lot of the other units are just pretty much the same. Yeah. So the danger there is if number one is done incorrectly, mm. then the rest are done incorrectly. Mm. And I quite often say to clients, to get an independent lawyer to look at this, it will take a lot longer because they will have to look at planning permission, building regs, road proposals, yeah. insurance, all these things that the developer had to do to get the building out of the ground, a conveyancer will look at. So it will take longer. It will be more expensive. But every time we take a look at a development that might have been transacted 20, 30, 40 times, we find something wrong. Mm. And it's not always a deal breaker. It might just be, right, Mr. Client, you need to insure against this to protect yourself when you sell and, you know, in the future. But it has to be done. There's a huge scandal at the moment around f leasehold houses. Mm. And these were being built on new build developments. Yeah, yeah. So that obviously now is is abolished and people can't do that. But 
people were saying, well, this is the fault of Persimmon or mm. Taylor Wimpy. Well, in my view, that's the fault of the lawyer for not making it blindingly obvious to the client what the ground rent is. Yeah. I've got a question coming in from Savannah, who's sitting in the in in the room just outside there. And she says, buying and selling, can you use the same solicitor? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing that? This is something that might change. So it will depend on regulation. There are two regulators in the space. There's the CLC, the Council of Licensed Conveyances, mm. and there are the SRA, which is the Solicitors Regulation Authority. The CLC say, yes, you can. The SRA say they advise not to. Right, okay. My view is there is almost always a conflict. How can the same owner of a business control two lawyers acting for seller and buyer and not have a conflict of interest? Mm. Even if you're in different offices, which is classed as broadly acceptable, yeah, there is either a, an individual or a company that owns that business that will want this deal to go through. Mm. So the benefit to the client and the agent and anybody else involved is it could be done a lot quicker because there's influence. Yeah. The downside and the risk is that they might overlook something on purpose. Yeah. There might be an issue that having two completely independent lawyers would fight it out to the benefit of the client. Yeah. And that is unlikely lawyers to happen. Lawyers love a fight amongst each other, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> It is, it is, it is a, it's a matchup, isn't it? Yeah. And, you, and the buyer and the seller want yeah. the best people representing Absolutely, them. Absolutely. I yeah. think, I, I would hope. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so what else do you, do you sort of get involved with then in the, in the average, in the average transaction that, that could come out the woodwork or, or what else do you, do you help with? Yeah. The whole process broadly is just a, an enormous due diligence process. Mm. So once searches are back, the uh, and, and sort of whilst this is going on and in parallel and in tandem to this, the lawyer will download the title and the register, have a look yep. for any restrictions, any covenants, have a look that the, the boundary or the extent of the property matches what the client thinks they're buying. Yes. Because the lawyer is very unlikely to go and have a look around. Yeah. So they're going off everything they can find, yeah. whether it's Google Maps or there are some prop tech businesses that provide yeah. information that are, that's really valuable. And it's really interesting what can be found then, because mm. when we bought this property, we actually found, this is about 15 years ago now, we actually found that the the property owned, uh, we, we were buying the land, but there was a little bit of land, actually, no, sorry, it was the last property. There was a little bit of land that we didn't own, mm. which technically we couldn't step over to get into our house yeah so common <laughs> that's so really common. it's it's funny isn't it how yeah. those little things you don't think about yeah. and that could have caused a massive issue yeah leases are just unbelievable mm. they really are a client can be buying a top floor flat thinking they have access to roof space yeah but they might not yeah access to common. their own balcony yeah. and might not yeah. they might have a car parking space over the way and not be entitled to walk to the front door. Yeah, that's right. And this is ridiculously common. And it goes back to quality. So these properties aren't new. These properties mm. have been through the conveyancing process yeah, a dozen exactly, times, yeah. and it's never been picked up. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Absolutely crazy that is to think crazy. that it quite more often than not, this process is done yeah. incorrectly. And uh, the other question that I get all the time is when someone comes for a remortgage, and I'm talking them through the remortgage process, and I say, "Oh, and obviously you'll need to get a a, a solicitor." And they go, "Why? Why the hell do I need a solicitor? Yeah. I'm just remortgaging. Why? Why do we need you then?" I think this is quite a topical point at the moment. So, somebody who's owned a property for twenty years and gone through that remortgage process every two to five mm. may have never used a solicitor of their own to remortgage. I think more commonly than not, 10 years ago, maybe less even, it would just be fee-free bank lawyer. Yeah. And the risk there is that only the only the lawyer represents, only the, only the bank only is represented represent by the, the lawyer. Yeah. The client yeah. isn't. Yeah. And the problem nowadays, I think, is that these fee-free lawyers, they aren't making any money, really. Mm. It's, it's, 
the cost of staff, the cost of keeping the lights on, the cost of insurance has gone up so much in recent years. And I'm, I'm not trying to get out the smallest violin. I'm, I'm just making the mm. very valid point that the lenders aren't paying the lawyers any more money. Yeah. So what, what's the answer? They have to do more work. So they stack the volume so high that it becomes impossible for that client to have any kind of interaction mm. with that lawyer. Bear in mind that lawyer is not even representing that client. Mm. So I think the advice from mortgage brokers and from lawyers to the to direct to consumer is a very valid one, which is actually, if you're getting some cash back, why don't you go and find your own lawyer? Because the benefit there is the lawyer can represent client and bank, can make sure your needs are protected. Yeah. They could do it far more quickly. I mean, for me, if a client's releasing some equity then, uh, you know, that, that money's important to them. It's either mm. to pay off debt or to do building work or go on a holiday, wh whatever it is, they're releasing it for a reason. I wouldn't leave that in the hands of a fee-free lawyer who's going mm. to take potentially months to do it. Yeah, I, I would send it to somebody who's got a specialist remortgage team who can do it yeah. really quickly. I'm not just saying this. I'm on record <laughs> and I've been told off lots of times this. I'm not a fan of fees-free at all. I do believe you get what you pay for. Yeah. And a lot of the issues we find as mortgage brokers at the end often come because it's a fees-free yeah. lawyer. They've done something a little bit wrong mm. or you just can't contact them. Yeah. And they're, you're in this massive, you're just a number to them. Whereas yeah. Yeah. if we recommend a firm like yourselves, you're, they're a name, they're a person, they're, mm. you're representing them. Yeah, so true. And, and also they're not lawyers half the time. Yeah. They're, they're, they are following an admin process. So if you throw something slightly complex in there, yeah. a transfer of equity, a, a lease extension, mm. I, th I think it's too much, if I'm honest. Mm. Are there any other typical questions that come up or, or things that, that I haven't mentioned? I, th I think the, the point, the, the huge point at the moment is around leaseholds and the mm. length of time that it takes to transact a property. The average in the UK is about... 145 days at the minute. 20 years ago, this was probably six to eight weeks. Yeah. So the, the process is dragging out and out due to more complexity. And I think the fact that the conveyancing factories, as I call them, the ones turning out thousands of volume every month, mm. are having such an impact, I think, over something like 60% of all chains in the country. And these are typically the slower firms. Yeah. Uh, coupled with the amount of lawyers who are one-man bands and perhaps dabbling in the process. So we, we find ourselves in a landscape where there aren't many law firms doing it really well mm. and efficiently in a time where actually there's just so much more to do in the process. Yeah. So to get it right, I believe truly there are only a handful of firms in the country that do this very, very well. Mm. And unless you're paying all the money, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's only a handful of firms that do it really well at a at a good value for money basis. Mm. And um, a client has to do their research. That's probably my biggest point. And just to finish, because time goes so quickly on yeah. the couch. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you're having fun. The, when, you're having when you're fun. having fun. No, I found that really interesting, <laughs> genuinely really interesting. Is um, of the, There's a lot of move uh, and a lot of discussion around tech. Yes. And I know that the whole conveyancing side is is ripe for mm. for innovation, and there's a whole movement at the moment to create. And you alluded to it earlier around sellers packs. Mm -hmm. So actually, if you're going to sell your house, actually, why doesn't the seller get together all the information that's going to be needed yeah. for any buyer, so that they have, as you say, all the searches, all most of the legal work done, and things can. Then if you're buying a property, you can download this seller's pack, yeah. which has all that information in there, maybe even a valuation as well, a survey report. Are you generally in favor of of tech coming in and, and how that can work and, and benefit your industry? Yeah, I think the tech needs to come in to replace the app inside of the process. Yeah. Lawyers go to law school, spend a lot of money on their education mm. because they want to get involved in the juicy parts of the process, the interesting parts of yeah. the process. They don't want to be just keying information from no. a form onto a computer, onto, yeah. onto a CRM Much or like whatever. mortgage brokers, yeah. <laughs> 
So for me, the tech has to come quickly to reduce admin in the process. Mm. I believe that there's too much duplication between estate agents, mortgage brokers, and yeah, lawyers. 100%. There needs to be a more joined up approach. There are many prop tech firms out there trying to find a solution, but they have to get in with all three areas of the industry, mm. not just, I've got an agency background, this is how I solve the agency part. It needs to be extremely yeah. collaborative. I'm in favor of upfront information because I can see a tangible difference in the transaction times when it happens. So we have clients that have ordered the local authority search at marketing stage for vendors, completed all their paperwork, got everything up front, and the average transaction time is about 60 to 70 days. Whereas in my view, that's exactly where it should be. So we know it works. Mm. I think the reason why there's a bit of nervousness to do this nationally is because a seller's lawyer represents the seller and doesn't give any information willingly because they're trying to protect the deal yeah. quite rightly as well. The buyer's lawyer has to proactively ask for this stuff. So I think there'll be some reluctance to get all the information together and give it voluntarily mm. because there could be some things in there that make it the deal go abortive or the buyer think, well, hang on, mm. now actually I'm going to reduce my offer and they may not, not have asked that mm. information in the first place. So it's a dangerous game. But yes, absolutely. And there needs to be some technology. What I'd love is like a property passport or something. Yeah. I guess like an NFT. Yeah. And it's transacted on the blockchain. Yeah. That would be the dream. That's Because that would go through straight away. looking at it. Yeah. But the land register behind on registrations a year or two. Mm. Local authorities are going through this automation process so the information can be given. I worked out by the time they get around every single local authority, it'll be about 17 years. You're right. Hello. So we are so far away from this. Yeah. Hopefully, um, you know, retired on the beach. Well, hopefully, not <laughs> that far, not as far away as you think. I know, I, I know, there are some big moves. Good, but thank you, Chris. I've really appreciated that. And um, yeah, for us, the perfect triangle of control is a good estate agent, a good lawyer, and a good broker, and that that's the best way to uh, to go. So, thank you, Chris. Thank you for watching. And if you do have any questions, please do uh, email us. All the details will be in the, in the show notes. And I look forward to joining you next time to find out who's next on the Corico Couch. 